fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Third on KCB, 106.5 FM Los Angeles, 102.3 FM Riverside, and 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back to the show. Joel Goldberg is here with me, and uh, we're going to talk about his new book. A new book comes out, I believe it's November 14th. That is correct. Third book in your series. It is, and it could be the last, although I have set it up for, of course, the capability to start another series of the same characters, but, you know, the next generation to step on beyond. I have a my small, loyal following. keeps saying, when's, the, when's number four coming out? I'm like, Really? I might do a few other other things first, but I have left it open, just in case. Well, I guess uh, in that, what you're saying is you you really like your characters involved, and you want to take them somewhere else, but maybe not in the same place you've taken them before? That is exactly what I want to do. They're done being, at least in the undercover spy-ish world, and now they're corporate. And they're one's married, and another one's older. And one doesn't have the uh, the, the see, control of what they're going to do. So, how do they respond to that? How do they react to that? That's how I'm actually going to, if I ever do another book or in, or write down notes about it while I'm thinking about other things. It's like, where do I want these people to go, and what story do I want to tell that's going to make them get there? One of the people we interviewed once said that. And I like I wrote that one down uh, because you're just like oh I got this story and I want to you know, stick the characters in but you know I got the characters I really do like I do like several of these characters I, and I'm happy to say that some of the readers my loyal small band of readers they they like them too uh, this, for the same kind of reasons I do so I I hit something there and actually I was just writing the last bit of it a couple of weeks ago when I was re-editing and looked at my wife and said you know I I like Bridger. I, I like this guy. I, I would I would have him over for a barbecue. Yeah, he's partly me, but he's still this other guy. He's got this other life. Well, hopefully it's a tame barbecue. It's not too wild. <laughs> <laughs> That's I, I burnt down my house a yeah. them, so, so, so it's like, not quite that tame. Yeah. Yeah. But, I'm not going to let him burn down my house. No. Well, maybe let, let him barbecue, so and then he can, <laughs> yeah. it'll, it'll turn out good, right? It's no fun. It sounds to me like um, the whole series to you, all three books, have been a um, a challenge, a work challenge, a writing challenge, like a big – There, it's not just a story. Like you you are developing what you – into who you want to be as a writer. How's that? Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of why I want to do something else. I, I had ideas. I just well, – I didn't want to just write action bang bang which is kind of where they sort of ended up but as i write in the acknowledgments in the last book devil's own day that i try to put some themes underneath each book if you look closely there's kind of the themes that i was going through at the time there, there's a uh, hope and there's relationships and this one is is changing transformation and so, like, you know, those little things, if you pay attention, are kind of underneath there, but I'm not slapping you across the face with it. And so I kind of wrote, practiced, tried to make the last book especially a little bit more, you now thoughtful, maybe better words, you know, that des- the descriptives, because I want to go into a, uh, not psychological thriller, uh, in that in that area, uh, domestic, and that requires, you know, different kind of characters different kind of words of use they're not they're not professional types agency people they are our neighbors so that's more of a challenge because i haven't really written that i'm kind of looking forward to it i'm very excited to do i've been taking down some notes making my i'm I'm a planter right so i kind of plan a few things and i pants most of it so i i need to have that plan just a little bit and then i just gonna sit down and i've actually banged out the beginning of it just to see what it's gonna look like and i don't mind it you know so that's that's my plan but it, in a way, what you're doing is you're just showing a different side of the characters, a different side of what's going on. I mean, because I find that 
there's two types of spy action books and stories, even even shows you see on TV or Netflix and movies and and that. And and some of them really focus on the action and the violence, the crime. Not necessarily. I'm not saying it's bad, but some of them really right. focus on all that. And the other parts are very subtle. The other parts of that character, like how much do you really know about, you know, Jack Reacher or something, because it's so focused on the other things. And then there's writers that tend to be more psychological. And perhaps that's more like what you're trying to be. Yeah. And it's, it's, I'm not a, it's not a spy book. I'm not a espionage. Right. I want to do, I teach social media and I talk about certain things in my class. And I'm finally saying, you know what? That actually would be a really good story for a book. It's actually threw it out of my classes. Say, what do you think about this? And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. So not that a bunch of college kids are my you know, crowdsourced test group, but I wasn't fully off on the idea that this, this might be something that's entertaining. So I, so, and by doing thinking of that, I'm like, all right, now I have to think about what these people who are in these situations are going to, are going to do. All right. Same thing for, you know, spy, you write them into the corner, they're surrounded by the bad guy, you know, and they are able to learn how to fly and get away. Not this stuff. This is, this is people's lives, houses, profession, reputation, all the things that are sort of important to us. The family, number one, fortune. So what, what kind of what happens in your mind and as the actions around you may be assaulting those kind of things? And it's happening every day. You see it in just every story in the news about something or, or your friends or whatever it might be. You assume it. You know, no, one's, no one has a great life. There's ups and downs. And so I want to you know, inject a little bit of adrenaline into it. And then by doing that, write with a idea that when I move forward, the character is driving me forward. The characters around them are driving me forward. Not the fact that they have to get to Manila and blow something up. This is human human actions. If that makes any sense at all. Yeah, it's it's just yeah, it's a different a different angle, and uh, it's interesting that change. Do you? But do you feel that the the more character that's inside the story? The more behind the scenes, so to speak, and the less action it is, the less well it's received from, let's say, a, a spy group. Well, I don't think the spy group will go for it. The thriller group, and there's a lot of authors. I'm, not, I'm trying to stay away from giving away exactly where I'm going because I just don't want to give away exactly where I'm going. But you know, this is not a new, I haven't thought of a new genre, a new angle on the thriller. I think I'm writing something that's going to be the next wave or it's already started in thrillers because espionage is sort of a dead area, at least dormant or slow. It's gone as far as it's going to go. And so I want to get somewhere that might be a growth part of it and be on the front part of that wave. And that that is exciting to me. And if my characters show that excitement, I'm, I'm even happier. And, I'm, and I'll stretch myself. I actually have to write differently. And I, that's why I wrote the, as I really barfed out the, the first chapter of the book, just having nothing in front of me besides just how would I open a book. And then I sent it off to a person or two. And I said, it, it, how's this? And is this different than the way I wrote in the Spy Devils books and Secret Wars before that? And they said, yes. So I, I'm moving in the direction. I'm learning. Uh, and I got to keep that up because I have to constantly tell myself, I just can't keep it to two, three, four word sentences all the time. And it's not, it, it's got to be dialogue that really sort of drives a story as opposed to the action that really drives the story. There are events, there are people on the other side of my characters that are, that are manipulative, which is for real. And they are um, forceful, which are for real. And so the question is, how does my characters who I'm building uh, react to that? Every writer thinks that. And I have to worry, I'm worrying about, can I do it in a new way of writing? Hope, hopeful. You know, I learn and I stretch myself. And I, and so I'm looking forward to that. The world events, um, without even getting into them, but how do world events affect these, you know, the um, thriller, espionage, um, spy books? Well, some of these uh authors like Brad Thor and the Biggies, 
mean, they're like they're prescient. They they are guessing what's going to happen. They're so into the research. Maybe the researchers just have talked and have access to so many people that they really are pretty good at projecting. Like you know, Russian Ukraine was written in, in many things, and tension in the Middle East causing other things. Those have been written, and they're sometimes not always obvious. It's like the Middle East tensions are a, a new thing, but you know how it expands and people react and how the agents, spy agencies or intelligence agencies around the world and the police organizations and the international organizations, how they respond to it is, is the critical element. So that that goes global, and that is you know, lots of different areas and intricacies that I think sitting outside Chicago, and I've traveled a lot in my life, but I am not from there. And it would take a lot for me to to write from the perspective of somebody who's actually living there it is from that area. Yes, I've had characters from the area, but they're interacting with my characters. I make sure they interact the right way, and I bring up the culture and the location. But I don't want to. I don't want to write on the international spectrum of events going on, and you know, all the, just the intricacies and the importance of making sure you're correct and don't offend. I don't want to do that. I'm not offend. I'll offend an American any day of the week, but I'd have to really immerse myself in the cultural part of it in the international world. I kind of think a little bit. All right, here's that inter- the international thriller market is kind of like the espionage. That domestic is a, a more of a growth area, or it already is a growth area, than the international thing for, for various reasons. I, I would think it would be a turnoff in a sense. The international, yeah, with with all the events happening and stuff, I would think that would, you know, unless you're like, well, I hate to say diehard word, but if you're, if you're, if you're intently into this type of storytelling, um, as a reader, you'd be drawn to it. But I think, I would think a lot of common people might get turned off by it because of the wars. Well, they're stressful, and it's like, how do I escape, right? The number one thing that we hear from all the authors that we talk to is that this stuff should be entertaining. And as you say, exactly, some people are only going to be entertained by international espionage and intrigue books, and that's a huge market, still is, and it may not be as, as a growth market, but it's still a huge market, and good. I, I, I read them or listen to them too, but I think that there's something to be said for having people say as they're reading the book, that could be me, or I know that person, or I've been in that situation, and here's how I respond, and this person may have done it differently. Whereas in the escapism entertainment world, it's like, I don't want to think about it. I just want a, a bang, bang, James Bond, or I want the, the guys who know how to, who know which weapon is what, and you know that's and that's absolutely fine. I'm going to flip to the side of that could be me. That's actually what I was thinking of when I wrote the original Spider, my first draft. I wrote it as a That Could Be Me book. And then when I got done with it, as on the international entertainment espionage thing, I went, ooh, this part of That Could Be Me is really boring. And I wouldn't want to read this, and I wrote it. So I, that's why I started getting into the more Mission Impossible-esque or things like that, the, the, the action part of it, and actually ripped out immensely. The, uh, the the that could be me part, but it's been a as I said those themes. The hope part is kind of like that, and the transformation part is kind of like that. The relationship part is kind of that, and so I wanted to have that in the next book. Right, right. Do you do you ever miss those days? Go back to what you were doing, the agency. Yeah. Um. Well, that's a that's a spectrumy question. It depends upon what's going on and what I want to do. Heck, I I would be in my almost my 40th year you know if i stayed in i would have retired i would have retired 10 or some years ago i miss i won't call it the the game or you, you be you're you, you're in the know secret war is the first book a, a key theme was that uh intelligence is narcotic that you just can't that's and we've talked to an author about talking to old old retirees and you know the line is really you may have retired, but you need that fix. And no matter no matter how you get it, whether it's going to the seminar and asking the questions of an expert so you can keep those the, the power going through those old you know tubes in your brain, but you, you, you had to have that injection. And that takes a while to go through uh, you know rehab on. 
And I don't need to have it. But every once in a while, especially after 9-11 when the phones were ringing, uh, we're like, okay, every, if they call you going in, that's just, that's just the way it was going to be and that you know, everything else be damned. Or what can you do to support? And I've been lucky enough in my all my careers to have been able to support as much as I possibly can, you know, that type of world. I worked in corporate intelligence, so I, had, I wasn't fully out of it, right? So do I miss the politics of it and the really, really bad people um, <laughs> that were there back then? I mean, just bad people. I mean, I'm in the, I'm in the mid-80s, middle-late 80s. So, the, so there were a lot of people who were in the end of their Vietnam career who went in the agency and have those war stories to tell because everybody loves their war stories. And now we have a, 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 a new generation. And it was, it was starting to happen when I decided to leave, and I was actually accused of this, was people were just coming in to stamp their resume, and then they could use it to get a job on the Hill. And that's, you know, come in three years, two years. Look, I worked there. I'm gone. I can write a book and say I'm a former CIA officer. And there's, there's some of that. And then there's the people who are just, I call them the drone bees. You know, they are there, and they are buzzing into work, and they have every day, every year, every decade, and they are there not seeking anything besides keeping our country safe and providing our policymakers information they can use to make informed policies. Is it perfect? No. Are the people perfect? No. Why would you expect them to be? But they're there, and they're patriots, and they're doing the best they can. Some are better than others from the point of view of being a human, but overall, we don't know them, we don't think about them, we just expect that they're doing it. And that's what I kind of miss, those people. I miss those people a lot. Right, right. In the name of the book, you The Spy Devils, what's, what's that in reference to? Well, I stole it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I as a writer or whatever, a creator, you collect things in your head and you keep them there and then someday down the road which ends up decades later you say i'm going to use that in fact there's a scene one of the last scenes in spy devils which is straight out of the sons of katie elder you know a john wayne movie which i've always just liked that moment and so i'm, like, I'm going to try to write that moment into the into the spy devils and so i did uh well but the spy devil name came from the devil's brigade which was a real brigade of World War II who the Germans were fearful of. They were basically commandos and did, es- not es- intelligence, they, they basically scared the crap out of the Nazis by showing up in their tent. They'd wake up in the morning and there would be something that they left behind saying, we were here, we could have killed you, but we didn't. So it's like a psychological thing. And that was the uh, William Holden movie, Cliff Robertson and a few others, about the Devil's Brigade. And here's to the devil. And I said, okay, I like that. I like the fact that this guy... They were they were feared, and so as if you've read my books, the yeah, spy devils are feared. But I didn't want, I, couldn't, I couldn't use devil's brigade or those type of things. But what are they? Well, they're spy. I hate. I really am not a fan of the word spy. But to get the sell the book in a short catchy title, I call the spy devils, and that was from the devil's brigade from that movie. It's exactly where I stole it from. You can take it. Sue me. Sue me. Hey, we'll we'll call them. <laughs> yeah, call call Bill Holden up and have him tell him I stole his movie. <laughs> I don't think he's going to answer. So what do you think the uh, best thing you learned uh, in 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 writing book three? What was the best thing that you got out of it? Well, it's almost the fact, that the idea that I did it. Because when I started the series, I knew I was going to try to write three books. And I knew what book one was going to be when I first wrote the boring draft. And I ripped it up and said, okay, it's not going to be that. Let's make this these guys. Actually, Bridger and the Spy Devils were a minor, minor character in the original book, and then I realized, oops, there actually are the main character, and my main character is, is an afterthought. So when I, I, I had that idea, I was strong. I got the second book, like, eh, okay, I've got these characters. I went back. I thought this was a genius idea. I went back, actually, my first book, Secret Wars. So I'll bring those characters forward 30 years. They're all older now. Like basically, those old retired you know, bomb guys. What do you, what do, you do when a, one old person goes after another old person? That's what happens. And then... I started. The, I got to the end of that book, and, like, and I had this. I knew how it was going to end, and but I didn't know who did it. Uh, so I didn't want to figure it out because I had to write it. So I just basically, to my shame, made it a cliffhanger. I didn't explain, but it drove the the vengeance ideal, which has gone through the book two, to create book three. And I was stumped, and I was like, "How do I? 
first of all, I had to figure out who did it. I kind of had an idea by the point of, you know, after a little while. So how do I fashion that into from that point to answer the question from book two and to make book three? And I know, and I knew the ending. I kind of always sort of know generally the ending that, you know, these, this is where the characters are going to end up and this could be, could be their next step. So I had this end, the beginning, which I had to do. And I had this ending, which I sort of knew. And I kind of had nothing in between. I mean, Zippo, blank page, no draft, no notes. And like, I'm stuck. And my wife watched me walk around in circles in the house hour after hour, look off in the space. And slowly but surely, I started collecting these ideas from the past and the, from the characters I created. And I kind of just said, all right, what would Bridger do now? And it's basically go beat the hell out of everybody who's pissed him off in you know, up to that point, which is, and I actually, as I said, I think maybe one of our radio shows, I crowdsourced that. I actually asked some of my readers, I, I messaged them, how do you, who, first, who do you think did it, did the, the ending of book two, and what would you like to see these guys do in book three? And they all kind of were somewhat off or in the area of who did it, but they all said, Bridger and the Spy Devils need to go kick people. You know, it's vengeance time. So I say, okay, I got my, I knew my, I knew that, and I, it's validated. So how do they do that? How vengeful is he? But I, as I mentioned, the book is called, is about transformation too. So how do I take this idea that maybe he's transforming from this vengeful guy over all the time to a little more, you know, I'm a little tired of this, or I don't have to be the, do this to prove who I am or to find myself. So I got a little bit of that. And then the pieces started falling into place. That that really helped. That I knew actually I sort of started thematically. I knew we would have to change. I knew we had to have relationships. How do I do that and keep the vengeance in line? Why? He's got to have tension between vengeful, vengeful bridger and transformative bridger. Right. Let's, let's right. create the story behind that. Yeah, and it's not instant. And there there no. is there there is a certain amount of pleasure for characters and readers, everybody. Uh, in uh, vengeance, right? Oh yeah, I mean, my what's my probably my favorite book of all time? Eh, I mean, Count of Monte Cristo. Okay, it's. I mean, I just wrote for my newsletter my top the top sort of five characters I used to I, that I read and looked at more focused than others when I went in to write the Spy Double series. Well, not the only ones, but the kind of characteristics, and it was George Smiley. James Bond was one of them. Sherlock Holmes is always number one, the greatest fictional character ever. ever. Uh, Philip Marlowe Sam, slash Sam Spade, and Edmund Dantes. So one of the one of these guys ain't like the other, right? The other guys are more contemporary. Three of them are thrillers. One's you know crime, and then I got a book from the old times. All right, I got Alexander Dumas. But they, all those characters had different characteristics that rose through my characters, whether it be steadfastness or thoughtfulness or vengeance for Edmund Dante's. So that is how I built some of the stuff behind the characters. Actually, some of that subconsciously. I actually thought, went back as I was writing my newsletter saying, who did I really pay attention to? Listen, I read a lot of books. I mean, I read all these Reachers and all that sort of stuff. But who were the characters that sort of impacted me in my writing? And those were sort of the five that came to five plus, you know, two, two of uh, and they changed their genre, right? Sherlock Holmes created created the whole thing, they created it all. Mm -hmm. If you want to do a detective story, George Smiley was introspective, but James Bond, well, Smiley was a uh, came to, is a some the flip of James Bond, right? Bond's his action guy, so he wrote George Smiley to be this thoughtful guy, right? The crime guys totally changed the crime genre, and then Dante's was Dante's. You're building characters, so I so I actually the character in my next book is female. Uh, I think it's important not that I not that I write a female character, although it's good, it's good to do that at least as I try to stretch myself. But the character in the story that I'm creating has more impact and drive if it's a female character. The, the response and uh, cultural and societal tension is different for women than a male. So that's it's very important to have a female. So right. I really haven't gone through. Um, her, I'm calling her Kate right now, for lack of a better name, um, and said, who is she like? I, I'm start, When I wrote that first chapter, I started getting an idea who she was. 
I don't write out character bios. I've never done that. Sort of doing it for Bridger. It just, he came, that, all that stuff that I, that I wrote just came out as I was writing. He, he exposed himself. To, well, I won't say that about you. He showed himself to me as a character. And I won't say he exposed himself because you would run, run like hell on that. I don't know what you mean. Yeah. Huh? I don't know what you mean. <laughs> this can be edited out. This is taken out in post. Yeah. Well, hey, listen. Listen, you know, one thing I, I find in a lot of writing, there, there's a lot of stereotypes. And it doesn't matter what type of book you're writing, whether it's a crime, a comedy, thriller, it's all, it's all, there's, there, you know, you get, and, and themes, you can get into paranormal and, and there's ideas of what people are or should be. You know what I'm saying? So when you get into this type of writing and you've got Mexican cartel and you've yeah. got, um, Chinese drug lord and all this stuff, yeah. are you taking kind of what we've seen as the standard and making that and putting that onto your character, let's say that you've created in these aspects, or do you go completely off and create a totally different person? Well, it's, it, it's an excellent question. Of course, it depends upon where I want that character to be and how I want them to interact with the other characters and everybody, you know, once again, every evil, evil person, thinks they're the good guy. They're just doing what they want to do. But I, the things I kept saying to myself is don't be cliche. Don't be, cliche. You know, don't be a jindo, jingoistic, ethnocentric you know, American trying to write a Chinese character without having an idea of what, how they would respond and react. I mean, try to be culturally sensitive because I, I want to make them believable characters. You, you talk to people, you read the books. And then that is why, and that's so far not true for the next this new book, is... A lot of those characters are based on real people or a combination of a couple real. So if this person is real evil and bad, these real evil and bad things really happened. Now, I can't, I haven't talked to them. I don't know what they were thinking at the time. Maybe they were thinking about what's for dinner when they were throwing people off the bridge. But, um, that, you know, that, that, that tells you about something. So that my main Chinese character is a real guy. He's in Australia right now in prison. Uh, my my Chinese my Mexican cartel guy is a real guy. He's still there. They're doing whatever he does. And he and a couple other couple. Of my original people that were spy devils, my Ukrainian oligarchs, and all that. Those are based on real pe- real people. So at least, and I can so I can see their. I watch them on YouTube, see their interviews, see what people wrote about them, and so I can get an idea and not be exactly what you're saying, which is stereotypical, unless the stereotype fits. And stereotypes come from somewhere. Right, but that is not, just not made up. They're based on something, right? You know, the the, the evil uh, drug lord. Well, guess what? You know, the drug lords have a tendency to be evil. You know, the child trafficker has a tendency to be evil. You know, so or or not a good person. So you can use those characteristics and bait real bait make realistic characters using real. The hard part I get to is when I have to make a, a secondary character. I want to be good. I don't have quite the foundation. I gotta find somebody from my past or something that I can base them on. I like having my characters based on real people to avoid exact, to strengthen them. I, yeah. won't, make it, I won't say it to avoid. Let's go the other way. To yeah. strengthen them so the reader says, once again, I know that person. That could be me. Oh, well, that's me. So you find it hard to find good people then? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I don't know about the next book, this new one, because I don't know who they are yet. I haven't got that. I have one, two characters, a husband and wife. Um, so I, and I have to do all the other people and it's going to be somewhat complex. I'm actually listening to a lot of, I'm reading a lot of Agatha Christie right now and doing a lot of mysteries again. Yeah. Not that my book is a crime who done it, but I want to see how they intricately put these pieces together and make it believable. I don't know. She's not really believable. I mean, it's not really believable, but, but make it work, not, make it work. Exactly. Make it so they're the most, you know, the number one selling author in the world. You know, like the best-selling book of all time, right? That that kind of of author, and, and you know, she was at the right time doing the right thing. And I didn't use Eric L. Perot as one of my five. I know I'm gonna have the Perot people all over me because it's Sherlock Holmes versus Eric L. Perot. But I think that Holmes was a much better character, much more important character for the whole industry than Perot. Oh, totally. Oh, yeah. I got some people who will fight me on that. You know, it's like get in the street and let's go. You know, and I'm like, are you, are you kidding? But they. Like anything. So once again, it's like the action adventure people. I need to have my international espionage. It's like, I don't want anything else. It's like, okay, fine, great. 
they they're firmly believe that, and there's nothing to not like. It's just that in the, comparing those two, it's Holmes. It's always Holmes, and always will be. I think Holmes was more relatable in a certain way. Yes, and that I was, don't that, know. Yeah. Well, I, that, that was sort of the intent. I mean, he was building, and he made. I mean, is he? Are the stories themselves flawed? All right. Does Doyle make a lot of mistakes? And they're sort of like, huh? Yeah. But almost every story in the four books, you it was about Holmes. You learned more about him as he went off doing what he does. And he, the particular story exposed us to the fact that, oh, he knows about that. Or, or he did have, you know, uh, scandal in Bohemia. You know, the, to Holmes shall always be the woman. You know, he had a, he had a, a love life, or a, a, somebody he was wanting to have a love life with, and he also had a fantastic bad guy who was just like him. So he was a bad guy, you know, Moriarty, and that really built his character because he had something to to build his life on. You learn he's a drug addict. You learn he can play a violin. You learn he knows all these scientific things. You learn about his brother and they just come into the stories. And so I, the, you know, the mystery stuff was there rather, you know, the stories were there, I think just to expose homes of the people. Right. But right. Well, people like the stories too, obviously. Yeah. But that, it just, it's the combination that works. Yeah. You know, we'll give it two thumbs up. <laughs> I'll give, I, I give home. I think Holmes is going to be big someday. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Well, so I kept, I got a, Back in the old bar mitzvah days, I got a book of all their homes, uh, all 56 short stories and four novels. And it is sitting on my shelf, and my seven year old grandson is going to get that in a few years. And he's actually got to read, you know, here's a book. This is called a book. And I think he is a good reader, book reader. And I'm, I'm going to give him that. Say, here, here, read these. And I'm going to give another one my my Three Musketeers and my uh, Count of Monte Cristo. Read these people. Read these. Hardy Boys? <laughs> Well, I have the Hardy Boys set. Wow. I, I've got them. And so I'm like, what do I do with the Hardy Boys set? Uh, I probably should give them that, too. I, I definitely want to read to him Treasure Island, which I think is probably what, one of the best of all times. Um, and that's that's something he should as a boy. Well, boy. It doesn't have to be a boy, but adventure, action, imagination, totally entertaining uh, is one of the best. So I want to read him that one. I'll give him a copy too. I just went downstairs and think about giving him. He's only what? seven though, so it's not quite there yet. Not quite. Almost. Just about. Oh, uh, yeah, almost. But it, 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 if I get him away from Minecraft and get him on, <laughs> uh, actually, a, a book. I think I, I'll give him an ebook. You don't want to flip. You want to. You don't need to swipe. You need to go yeah. ahead you know, or pretend you're turning a page and that's swiping, um, an actual physical page. But I think I, I need to expose them to these. Other times, other places, stimulate imagination. That's what it, those books do. Yeah, it makes for a far better person, you know. Usually. You hope. You well, hope. you hope. that uh, Better chance at being a better person, maybe. You're that. exposed. You're, you're seeing something that's not just showing up in your social media feed. Yeah, that's that's all I do. I know, you're a TikToker. <laughs> no, very little, actually. Oh, you're the ticker, you're a talker. <laughs> I do a little bit, but not that much. I put my dog on there. And people are loved. I'm sure people who have dogs as their preference, they're getting pushed to your dog pictures and photos faster than you can even go woof woof. Yeah, they like it. A 19 year old dog still yeah, out you have walking. Old, you have a lot. Yeah. You have yeah. dogs. You're a but, dog guy. Well, yeah. And, and old dogs, well, they, they make people happy. Yes. And my daughter's dog has the dog equivalent of ALS. And it's just sad. Oh. Great dog, big dog. Just totally lost mobility and basically the back legs. I'm like, just God, it's it's a dog that wants to be a dog. Yeah, and I just my buddy, her dog, and I go way back, and it's just I can't even look at it. It's so well, sad. it is sad. It's it's the change in, in life is always sad. Always well, actually, I, and to be a lousy dad about it is, I go, can I write a guy of a sick dog into a book into one of my characters? You know, to give them some depth. Maybe it's you. You're, you take care of dogs and you get, yeah. you know. And so somebody who, you know, it's not important necessarily, but you see through them. And I, and I have an example right in front of me is this dog that I really like a lot. And so I can use that and perhaps show a little bit more depth of character. And, and maybe that, maybe that will have some sort of plot significance down the road. Well, it's all about the interactions. 
That's how you learn your character, right? Yeah. Well, I yeah. Think. They yeah, talk yeah. to me. They got to talk to you. They got to interact with me. Yeah. Then, and then I can tell, put them in the positions of them interacting with whatever I'm writing and let them decide what the hell they're going to do next. That yeah. happens all the time. Yeah. I, yeah. I sit back and go, okay, guys, get, get yourself out because I have no clue what you're going to do now. And they yeah. do. And you start drinking and I, I diet Coke. So to stream. It's not on my I, Weight Watchers. A soda stream, I'm not a fan of. I'm a soda streamer. Really? I, I got a new one. I, I wore the other one out. I guess so. I still got one sitting that I barely worked on. Join the cult. No, I, I, I don't really like it. I constantly, well, I gave up for a long time just drinking straight Diet Coke because I was an addict. It's right. kind of crept back into my into my routine. But this was basically pretending I'm not drinking Diet Coke by making my own, right? So yeah. that, that's how shallow I am. You but I, I, if, if someone says, you know, what do you, when you're writing, what do you have? I go, I've got jazz on and I got, some, I got something to drink. I got to have a big thing of flavored waters or something. Yeah. yeah. No, no I, I do too. I just, I don't, there's not enough flavor in it for me. You put your own in. Oh, I guess. Yeah. And you can, you know. It's it's getting the bubbles just right. It's it's like writing a book. You get those bubbles just right. If not, you go, eh, that's no good. How's that for a metaphor? Well, there you go. That's Take that's it. the whole story. That that's the title of your next book. I'm scribbling. Getting the bubbles just right. Getting the bubbles just right. Actually, that's not bad. Getting yeah. the bubbles. That's that could be a chapter. Chapter. Or it could be your um could be your memoir. <laughs> it's, it's my memoir, yeah. Well actually it could be. Could be We're written on the old tombstone. Here lies Getting, Joe. He never got the bubbles just right. Getting the bubbles just right. Here lies yeah. <laughs> bubbles. <laughs> yeah. I'm having a little bubbles etched in it in sort of a QR code kind of way. Yeah. That's the way we do it. So now, The Devil's Own Day. Yeah. Spy Devil's Thriller. Spy Devil's Book 3. Now, um, are you, it's going to be on uh, hardback, paperback, Kindle, audio, all that? Like, How it's are you not- doing it? It's this one is not yet on Audible. It might or an audiobook. Uh, maybe I'll do it for next year, but it is on everything else. And it's available through JoeGoldbergBooks.com and most of the other sites. Uh, yeah, and you know, if anybody has any questions, I have a, I, I interact with my my readers. So if you send me a tweet or a something. It's it's very rare that I at least send something back and say, "Hey, thanks." Or this is this is just a horrible thing. That's like I don't need to waste time with you, but. And I, I always say a thank you or answer a question or, you know, sometimes it gets overwhelming, but, you know, to go to the site, join the, get the newsletter, find my email, send me an email, send me a text, send me a tweet, an X, a tweet. And, uh, and a Y, a Z. A Z, that's right. A T, a ticket, a talk, and a, and I teach, like I say, I teach social media. It's like unbelievable. I don't, I don't even speak their language anymore. I'm or a Z if you're from Canada. That's right. Yeah, said you're said talk. Wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> well, Canadians are wrong about everything. So come on. Um, okay, so that's out, and, or that that will be out um, for the interview and stuff like that. And uh, you know, we wish you the best, and yeah, I, and, and hopefully, thanks for having me on as a guest. Have, thanks for having me on as a host. It's been actually, and I say this in my acknowledgments of the book that having you call me up and ask us have asked me to be a host for the show has been. One of the probably the highlight. I think I've told you this before of of, of, of this whole thing. That I, I yeah, you know, you're a good guy. We're friends. Yeah, fine. but I get to talk to all these great authors. Yeah, and I do take notes and I learn. I and I and I. So I, that's what a great experience. So I greatly appreciate that. Yeah, I hope the reader, hope the listeners understand how valuable you know, Al Warren is to our industry. Oh. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. Well. You know what? Um, you got to make a difference. That's what that's what life is. Nothing more. Exactly. Well right? said. So that's the only reason I do anything. It's will it make a difference in a good way? And you do it. Yep. And well, you are. So you know, well, that's good. Do it while I can, because next you week know. it'll be someone else. You never know when your bubbles are going to run out. Yeah, my bubbles. I got to get them just right. Yep. Okay. Well, thanks, Joe. Thanks. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. 
was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.